looking back on how difficult it was during that first year of marriage with Eva, I, I can't believe we, we survived it. I can't believe we still had a lot of a lot of good times, you know. Um, but we had there were so many things that had to change, and we were on the path to to changing um, whatever we had to because I was determined, she was determined. We were going to be successful. We're going to be together. We're going to make this work. And despite lack of money, you know, one of the nice things that 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 I don't know if it exists anymore so much in, in the U.S., but surely um, in other parts of the world, you can't just go get credit cards like you like you did back then. I think I think it was easier back then to get a high credit limit. So we were able to still, it wasn't as stressful as you might think if you really had, you know, the little amount of money we had and, and nowhere else to go. But we, you know, we had these massive credit limits. We tried not to use them, but hey, if we have to go visit her family once a year or we have to, you know, go to a date night once in a while, um, it was something we could do. But so we're coming back. This is 1994. Um, and we're coming back from summer in Wisconsin, driving back to Colorado. And I knew that things had to change uh, in terms of a job. Something had to change. I couldn't just be doing telemarketing. It was miserable. I wasn't making enough money. And so I knew I was going to be, you know, looking for something else. And Eva was going to start going to college. Um, so that, that was a huge success. She got accepted. Now we're in state tuition. So she, she did go to college. Now, I was studying um, marketing. I was I made the first year. Of course, you don't get to the business curriculum yet, but you study the, the, the basics. I was doing all right. And she her, her goal was to become a physician. So she wanted to go to med school, which was like, a, obviously, in the U.S., a long path, eight years, and then internships and everything else. Um, so she was going to start. I I was um, you know into my my second year, um, and we came back and I and I found a job at a window factory. <laughs> um, so I worked on the assembly line, and you know it was an experience. It was it was rugged, tough guys, really sort of abusive behavior, um, a lot of teasing, but that went a bit beyond teasing. I learned to do chewing tobacco, which was a disaster because that stuff that I don't know about the Norwegian snus and all that, that's probably fine. But like this American stuff, it just ruins your mouth. Your your gums are just completely uh, destroyed and your, your teeth are being are rotting and you can't quit this stuff. It's so strong. It gives you such a high. And I, I battled with that for a couple of years and finally, finally quit. I would actually, because you're addicted, right? You can't just not do it. So you do it at work. And then suddenly you need to do it at home. And of course, Eva was disgusted by it. Uh, she didn't understand what I was doing. And so she, she said, throw it away, never again. And I said, okay, of course, you know. And then I would hide it behind books. I would have a have a um, can of beer in my hand watching a movie, watching TV and, and spitting into it. And, and, and one, <laughs> here's a story for you. Um, one time she... I went to the bathroom and, and I had this this can of of spit, and she took a swig of my beer, and vomited completely. Oh my god! <laughs> One of the things that happened by this time is that my parents actually realized that probably the path of renting wasn't the best idea, and we were able to find a little bit better apartment, small, but kind of nicer looking apartment, and we bought it. They bought a condo. And we, of course, we paid. We made the payments, but they they co-signed for a condo. It was like forty six thousand dollars, and um, so we were excited about that. We're living in a new place. Things were looking up a little bit. I got that job. I didn't like the window factory, but it felt like a real job. I can't remember what Eva was doing. I think she was still babysitting and going to school. I'm gonna have some memory gaps in this story. It's a long time ago, isn't it? And life went on. Um, we went to, we visited Slovakia for the first time that Christmas. And again, had a wonderful time with her family and, and all the, the Christmas traditions. And, and just, you know, it was wonderful. And 
there was nothing really dramatic that happened during that year. I, I, I gained some weight because I kept eating as though I was an athlete, but I was done with sports. Like I didn't do any exercise. I didn't follow any sports on TV. And I kept eating as though I was burning, you know, thousands of calories a day. I, you know, I, I had been running miles and miles and, and then training and then weightlifting. And then, you know, I, so I, I couldn't get enough food. I couldn't afford enough food. I was eating. I remember when I was playing basketball, I was eating, um, I would just take a bunch of cheese, a bunch of different kinds of cheese and just fry it on a pan and eat it. <laughs> that's, like, that's how hungry I, I was. But naturally, you can't keep doing that, you know, when you're, when you're um, <laughs> not working out. And so I was gaining weight. I also was kind of brainwashed by advertising and mainstream culture. I remember I would have, I would buy frozen waffles and, and have that for breakfast with maple syrup, with, you know, with fake maple syrup or, or pop tarts or, or toaster strudel. <laughs> Can you imagine thinking that was a good idea? We would have, we'd buy, instead of just buying a chicken and making it for dinner, we'd buy the box of frozen chicken that was already had the breading on. Like I was such a consumer. I was drinking soda um, at least two a day, at least maybe more than that. Um, and just really gaining, gaining weight. I wasn't obese, but I definitely had a belly and, and kind of a boxy, you know, big, I'm a big guy. I'm six foot four and, um, I was big and, um, that year wasn't very eventful. We were, I think we were just grateful to get kind of get, you know, the new apartment and, and move forward and things were fine. Um, I can't remember too much else from that year that's significant. And, and some of this is going to be a blur now, the college years, but I know at some point, at some point, um, well, that, that spring, so I came back from Slovakia and, and I quit the job at the window factory. So that, that only lasted about four months. And I got a job across the parking lot from that place. There was a computer uh, retailer. And in the early 90s, that was actually a business model where people, where companies would, would resell computers to businesses and some consumers. But of course, they were in the stores and the Best Buys and so forth. But there was a like the business to business they're trying to position this different you know different lines of computers and and, and excuse me and, and copy machines fax machines office technology re, uh, retailer re, reseller and i couldn't believe it i had a desk i got a job where i had a desk you know so far i had i had been mowing grass as a kid i had been working in a gas station for a little while Worked in a telemarketing. Well, I had a desk there too, I guess I should say. But um, I, I had cleaned buildings. I had worked in a factory. So, you know, being a business student, to be able to have a desk and not just have a desk, but I mean, go to work with a tie on. Like we were required to wear ties. The funny thing is, on that job, at that job, I didn't have a computer. <laughs> So I was selling office technology and laptops and desktops and and computers, but I didn't have a computer on my desk. So I had a book of all the products we're selling and a phone to call the the uh, wholesaler, Ingram Micro, I guess it was. And I had to like, the customer comes in, sits, sits at my desk. We had a few demo models on the floor, um, but then I had to like somehow know what to ask. What are they looking for? What are the requirements? How many and basically put together a proposal of which computer, have some brochures. If you're lucky, you have a, a demo of at least that brand of laptop, if not that exact model. And, and then you have to place the order and, and, and just, you know, at some point you, you just wonder what you're doing or, or why this, this model was necessary. But um, we, we, we didn't make a killing, but it was, you know, enough to keep a couple people employed on the, on the retail floor. And we'd have teachers wander in and we'd have, Business, small business people wander in to, to make some purchases. And I had that job um, for a little while and I had doubled my income from the factory. And so things were looking up, right? And we were, you know, we were skiing. Um, I was still doing some mountain biking. I said I wasn't doing anything, but actually I was still doing some mountain biking. And in Colorado Springs, that's a, that's an amazing thing to do. The I forget the names of all the parks, but there's this parks you go to the mountain and you're going straight uphill which is hard which is hard biking but i loved mountain biking and at this point i had taken up skiing so we would we would go a couple times in the winter uh through college go to vale or breckenridge or these other places and we would drive early in the morning and then drive back at night and and it was just 
a wonderful thing to be able to do as a kid from Wisconsin to be able to, to be able to go skiing. So I was starting to feel pretty good about life. I mean, I'm with my wife. We're not fighting as much. Of course, we loved each other. We're dependent on each other. We trusted each other. Nobody's ever cheating or anything like that. And um, it was kind of starting to work. We had this sort of pride that we're building this life together. And whenever we would go to Slovakia, uh, well, the first time was that Christmas, but you know, we'd bring gifts. We'd, we'd take the credit card and go buy some T-shirts and, and clothes and bring a bunch of gifts to kind of show off that, hey, she wants to show off that we live in America and we have all this stuff. And the whole family would come over and, and we'd give them their, their gifts and, and film it <laughs> with, a, with a camcorder. Um, if we had one, it was we had an old camcorder. I'm not sure if we filmed it in the 90s, but later on. And uh, life just kind of went along. Um, and at some point, I, I got a job at, a, at another computer reseller. Same business model. It was called DMA and Associates. And I doubled my salary again. So naturally, I took the next job and doubled the salary. I, and things were, like I said, looking up. I was feeling pretty good about the future. At some point... Um, Eva started getting different jobs as well. I think she, well, we, we still were ha- applying for her permanent residency. It was a long process. After Even after getting married, you still go through like a year or so. And the, of course, the babysitting was mm, cash, you know. Um, and then I think at some point she, I forgot all the jobs she had. She worked in a museum. Um, she did a couple different, she worked in a dental office for a while. She did a couple different little jobs. And um, it was fine. Not going to bore you with just year, years going by that were fine. Maybe I can just kind of combine the Colorado Springs college years or the undergraduate college years into kind of a the same conversation um, without having to go chronologically. Um, there was one time that that Eva that we went to Slovakia. I guess it was the next year, the next summer. We tried to make it every year. Not an easy trip, two transfers, you know, long, long, arduous trip. And um, one time she stayed a couple weeks after me. So I came back earlier to go back to work and I decided to buy a guitar. I never played any music. Well, I played, no, I didn't play any musical instruments really until then, but I loved to sing. I loved I love bands like R.E.M. And, and U2 and Matthew Sweet. And then by this time, I guess we're getting into, yeah, we're still into that, kind of that early 90s, mid-90s alternative stuff. And even the radio wasn't bad back then. Um, so I, I actually, my plan was to surprise her. I think it was like I had a week or something, and I played guitar like crazy just to learn one song, to learn, to learn three chords. My fingers were bleeding my I had to put band-aids on and that didn't really you can't really play with band-aids on your finger. And so I learned one song and the song was Breakfast at Tiffany's. Three chords and she came back home and I said I have a huge surprise for you. She thought it was going to be a cat or something. And I brought out the guitar and I played that song and kind of, you know, got through it and she's like, "Oh, okay." <laughs> so there's that. I guess the next thing that's in, that may be somewhat interesting is um, we got married in Slovakia because we had the we had the wedding in the courthouse and we always I always told her that we'll have a proper wedding with your whole family in in Slovakia. I'm skipping ahead now until 1996, so three years after our actual wedding, we had a, a wedding in, in in Slovakia and. Um, you know, for the whole family. Up until then, they didn't even know we were married. I mean, her parents knew we were married, but her her uncles and aunts, she kind of played this story that we were not married because we wanted to have the wedding, the proper, she wanted to have the proper wedding. And my, my, my grandmother, my parents wouldn't travel. They, they, they had the money for it, but my mom being obese, my dad being, being um, you know, handicapped, um, disabled a little bit, didn't feel comfortable making that, such a trip and they just didn't have passports and didn't didn't come to the wedding because, you know, my mom was that, she couldn't have probably done it really. And my grandma, some kind of mid-70-year-old grandmother and Eva's, the girl that Eva, Eva lived with in 
when she was an exchange student in Wapaka. So my grandma and, and Noreen, um, her, her sister, right, in, in America, um, who she lived with when she was an exchange student, um, came with us. And of course, that was their first international trip. And it was a really big deal. I mean, it was it was it was such an amazing wedding. It was just like a movie to me. It was the the, the traditional Eastern European weddings are are something so extraordinary. All the traditions leading up to the wedding, the the rituals, the the formal events at the at the parents' house. Um, you know, you're reading stuff. You're doing these ritual these sort of um, rituals or or just traditions. And then, of course, a beautiful cathedral for the ceremony. And then we, we went to um, a hotel by the lake and, and just partied all night. You just, you just have, you know, 50, 100 people and, and you, you dance until 4 a.m. It just goes on all night. And even the next day you have, you have um, lunch to finish the food and everything. But amazing food, amazing music, a live sort of gypsy band, a DJ. So they alternated. And it was the time of my life. It was it was just the most amazing thing. My grandmother um, and Noreen totally fell in love with Slovakia. Um, we traveled the mountains. We saw the castles. Um, my grandma, of course, understood nothing. I understood nothing. I started learning a few more words and studying a bit of Slovak and saying a few cute sentences here and there. Um, but you're not really motivated to study your foreign language when you're not spending time there. If it's once a year, you're making a trip. But I tried. I did try to learn the language. And I always got a little bit better and better. But my grandma would sit in a room and just enjoy looking at everybody and just the whole the whole scene of how beautiful that tradition is. She came from Poland. Um, her parents came from Poland. So she came from a Polish family in Wisconsin where it was like they had... They had a bunch of, you know, little communities where the Polish people lived here, the Irish people lived here. So she had some, the food she was very familiar with and, and the traditions and, and things. So she was, it was just the time of her life. She said it was the most wonderful trip of her life, obviously. And we drove to Poland one day just so we could say we were in, we were in Poland. And again, just the third time in Slovakia and it just gets better and better. We spent about three weeks. And I remember on the flight back, Noreen was crying like I was already used to it I knew, I knew I was coming back but Noreen knew it was probably her last time and she was crying on the on the plane that she didn't want to leave she didn't want to go back to her real life now you wouldn't think about that as an American that you'd feel that way about a place that you know America's the best right that's what we're raised to believe but I started falling in love with Slovakia and I would and I was I would live for coming here coming to Slovakia once a year I would think about it half the year like just count down the days and of course, I was very sad to leave always, even though I realized, you know, it was a lot of it was constructed. The family would do, would come visit all the time and things would happen trying to convince, condense life into those three weeks. And in real life, you don't have all these events happening, all these people visiting all the time. So it was a little bit of a show um, at that time. Um, other notable things, um, Eva's sister came to visit once um she, she she was very beautiful she was four years younger blonde long hair skinny and attractive and um yeah that was kind of my forbidden crush to look at her once in a while i shouldn't probably shouldn't say that but i'm gonna say a lot of things i shouldn't say because who says i shouldn't say the truth um didn't do anything inappropriate but she lived with us for for a summer and we camped in Colorado, we played tennis. We did whatever we could, just going different places and parks and and um, you know typical stuff. I one time my friends visited from from high school. Um, a group of them came out to Colorado mainly to see Colorado, but also to see me and Eva, and I had a nice time. Um, we we met a couple friend finally in, in college, Clinton Jennifer. So we had a friend to hang out with. They were they were ex military. They're a bit older than us. But they were going to the same university and we would we would um go watch movies with them and go to movies with them and, and they'd come over and then we'd come over and, and have some beer and, and have a little party, you know, as couples do. That was nice. Um 
normal life. You know, um, I believed in my my path. I believed that uh, I, I would just get this degree and, and have a good job in business and keep doubling my income every time I got a new job. And Eva was going to be a doctor. And we worked, man. I, one thing I didn't say that is that during college, how do you have a full-time job? This, this time I had a full-time job ever since I went to the um, to DMA. So the second computer job, it was full-time. So I, we had the option to schedule classes only after, after work hours. So I would go to work all day, then I'd drive straight to school. I'd drive there with my tie and my dress pants and my dress shirt. So I didn't exactly fit into the cool kids at school. I was this business guy with my briefcase and my business, my dorky shoes, my cheap dress shoes. And I'd go to these night classes, a little bit overweight. And at some point, sometime around the same time, um, my, my grandparents sold their farm. I told you earlier in the episode, in the talk one about how they had this farm with a barn and everything. They sold their house because the, the highway was going to come through and they sold it ahead of that to developer. And my parents got a bunch of money, like a massive amount of money, hundreds and hundreds of thousands. And they gave me and my brother 20000 each. Now, at the time, I thought that was a lot of money. But they gave the televangelist preacher um, more than that. And of course, they paid off their house and they kept some for themselves. And you know, they kept it and spent it themselves on a hot tub and everything else. And I got 20000 Okay, I'm not complaining. This is not... <laughs> I, I sure as hell hope I don't come off as a victim ever in these, in these talks because that's not the case. This is the life I chose and the adventure that I wanted for myself. But I got this money. I had the job. And I got my dream car. Ever since I, w- I was 18 and moved away, I dreamt of a convertible. At first, it was a Chrysler to Baron convertible because that's all I could afford, even though I couldn't afford that. But with this money, I bought a used Mazda Miata for like 9000 something, $9,600. And this is like in the later 90s, like mid to maybe 96, 97-ish. And... So here I am with this job and this this Mazda Miata. I'm a tall guy, which is kind of funny. My knees kind of touch the dashboard. But I had my convertible little two-seater, and it was fun. It was the most fun I've ever had. It was just, wow, what a dream. I remember driving home when I bought it. I was playing Simon and Garfunkel like in in um, Mrs. Robinson or something. And I just, it was beautiful to live in Colorado, the mountains and the the nature. And Colorado Springs is is a beautiful town. But my life was hard every day, work all day, go to class every night. Well, when do you study? Well, that's the weekend. So I might have taken Saturday off sometimes or most of Saturday off. We'd go to the mall and go out um, once we were 21 um, or go to, you know, like I said, go to the movie, go to Ponderosa or go to some kind of cheap restaurant. But it was grueling. And I did that for for. In the end, it ended up being four years. Four years of my life, I worked full-time and I went to university full-time. The other thing is that I got straight A's during that time. So I wanted it, right? I, I wanted, what happened is I wanted an MBA. I wanted to go beyond just a bachelor's in marketing. And I, I, my goal was to get an MBA and or, or, or either go to law school or MBA. I wasn't sure, but I know that I needed. I knew that I needed good grades, so I did. You know, turn my academics around. And those in the last two years of my undergraduate, it, it was I worked at it really hard. But at some point, when I got when I so I, I decided, even though I took the the not what do you call that? The, I forgot the LSAT. I think it is for getting into law school. I applied to law schools. I took the LSAT and I got accepted. But I decided that probably business is more suitable to me versus all the, the legal stuff. And I made the decision to just stick with the same university. And um, and I earned my... And then I went for my MBA in technology management. And 
the MBA was easier. And I think it was because I just became more intelligent from all the, from everything I'd done. I had a job already. I knew kind of something about business. I wasn't I wasn't a wait a waiter. You know, I was I had a job in business. I had studied really hard, but at some point my mind just switched and I started to be able to just listen to the lectures and not take notes and not stu- not read everything, but just listen and absorb everything being said and then able to pass exams with A's without having to do that much studying. Um, so it became a lot more fun during those times. We started making friends because we we're older. There were international students from all over the world, Costa Rica, Norway, Sweden. And we had a group of international students, which because Eva was was international, that I was able to hang out with and make friends with Japanese people, Asian people. And we would party. These guys were, we, you know, now, now we could, we we're of legal age to drink. And we would go to the club in Denver. We'd pile the car. The we'd have, We had two cars. We had, we also inherited my parents' uh SUV, the GMC, uh, Jimmy, and we'd, I'd pile like eight people in there illegally and drink and drive home. I mean, it was, these were wild times. Eva was fun. You know, she was fun in the sense that we could laugh and party. We had a, one time we had a Halloween party at our apartment, at our condo. And I think a hundred people came. There was beer on the carpet, beer on the walls. I, I still, I still find beer and things that I, that I owned from back then because it was wild. Um, I remember just amazing music, Pulp, Bell and Sebastian, uh, Radiohead. And I started getting into this more interesting um, kind of alternative music and started kind of seeing myself as being a little bit more hip, I guess. I, I loved music. I always loved music so much. Um, I was also playing guitar a lot. I was, I was learning a lot of songs for many years. I was learning cover songs and playing and singing. And then and then at some point, like, why don't I try to write a song? That'd be fun. So I just took a chord progression and wrote some melody and lyrics. And I started writing songs just for fun. I started smoking cigars, driving around in my Miata, smoking a cigar. One time I took my guitar in the trunk and Eva was studying or something and I went to on the mountain roads and almost killed myself speeding around corners. Took my guitar into a field and sat on a rock and played, smoked my cigar. Had a lot of fun. We met some friends from from uh, Boulder University, University of Boulder of Colorado Boulder, uh, Norwegian and Slovak couple. Went hiking with them to a lot of the really steep high mountain peaks couple times went camping in Moab Utah with them went camping once in a while so it was a it was a pretty good life and I don't I don't mean that there's anything necessarily interesting in this in this segment I just wanted to provide the reality that that life isn't just about positive or negative or about good times or struggling times I think I think it's both I think it's everything at once and this this certainly at this part of my life it was everything at once. Um, I, you know, I still had, especially when we were starting to party a little bit, um, some of the girls we're hanging out with in the group, I kind of had some pretty pretty heavy crush on, 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 on some girls sometimes. And um, one time at, at a dance club, I actually danced with with this this Japanese girl and kissed her cheek and Eva saw it and um I was this close to like I was really close to cheating or you know I had gone since you know age 17 with only one girl and now I'm 21 22 23 24 and the urge was starting to really creep up I like I I would do anything for just a different you know different girl, just for the night. And I told Eva about it. I told her that maybe we could try something fun. Maybe we could try some threesome or something like that. And she went nuts. Of course, she went nuts about. She always would go nuts about that stuff. But I it was a real problem for me. I loved I loved Eva completely, hundred percent with all my heart. And 
would do anything for her. I mean, I, I supported her through college during times I needed it. She supported me through college. We both cooked. We both did dishes. We took care of each other. We were equals. We had the same goals. We loved her family. She was not, she was good to my family when we, when we would visit. My grandma would come fly out and spend time with us for Thanksgiving. Sometimes she spent a week with us uh, by herself. She'd just come out and, and spend time with us. And it was wonderful times. And Yet there was this underlying desire. And it was nothing that, I don't think at that time at least, it was nothing lacking in our relationship. She was very attractive, more so than me. Beautiful. Beautiful accent, beautiful figure, beautiful face. She was never that nice to me. She was, she was you know, she was a hard person. She's a, she's a, well, she's a pretty strong ego. She's a Italian woman, right? That sort of thing. But I was tough. She she taught me all the manners. She taught me how to eat, eat with a knife and fork and how to go to restaurants and enjoy that aspect of life and and how to, you know, how to fit in. But at the same time, we'd go to parties and she'd always scold me for something. I remember every time, and this happened ever since we started going to parties or going to visit friends, that on the way home in the car... There was something I said or did that was the worst of that of that day, right? So it doesn't matter if it was minor or if it was major. She would choose something that was inappropriate that I did. And I would have to really hear about it and feel shamed all the way home every single time. So that's not... Yeah, that's not the way to do things. You don't you don't criticize. You don't own the person and criticize the person. And that's kind of what it, what it got to be that, oh, you embarrassed me, you know. I was, look, I was a kid. I mean, I was still, you know, a young person that's going to want to have fun and get crazy and say something crazy. And there were times that it did get ugly. I remember one time um, I got jealous because she actually started to kind of fall for this other guy. She would talk on the phone with, with this Swedish guy every day. No, we're just friends. We're just friends. Yeah, right. You're just friends with a, with a guy. You're, you're laughing. You're laughing in the other room. And one time they danced at a, at a house party or at a, an apartment party. And I had a lot to drink. I was at that point of, of that, you know, it's brainstem functioning, but not much else. Animalistic, you know, instinct kicks in. And I poured beer over her head <laughs> in front of every, in front of our friends. Oh, my God. Yeah, that didn't end well. You know, there, so there started to be some violence, um, never from me. I never, I never hurt her physically, but she did hurt me physically. She did feel that it was totally fine to attack me and hit me, kick me, slap me. But that was normal, right? That was my, my wife and it's because she loves me, right? That's what I thought, but yet there was this, there was this underlying need to be with a woman who, without the conditions, to be with a different woman just for the thrill. But there might have been something emotionally about that, to have that feeling of being free, being accepted, the weight of all these expectations not there. It's an amazing fantasy for a guy, and probably for a woman too, who feels controlled, who feels abused a little bit. But I wouldn't go so far to say that that you know, that, that we shouldn't have stayed together or that it was so wrong that, that it wasn't going to work. You know, we were right on track for total success. I was going to graduate university beyond that, have an MBA, have a graduate degree. And I did it and I had my wife and we, we made it. It was a really gratifying, gratifying feeling. And we, we always wanted to project success to our families, to, to, to everyone in the world that we knew, that we were successful. We were the ones who made it. We got out of our hometowns. She got out of Slovakia, which back then was kind of considered backwards. And I got out of Wisconsin, a small town, which is, of course, considered backwards in the, in the world. And, you know, I went from being a Christian to being a typical liberal um, atheist because of university. Eva was always agnostic, atheist, but we, we did not have any spirituality at all. Our faith was in ourselves. Our faith, our faith was in education. Our faith was in money and status 
and luxury and things. We'd go shopping and buy clothes. I'd, lo- I'd love going to the mall and, and finding sexy outfits for her to wear and for, you know, for me to wear stuff and go partying that very same night wearing it. 